you know, before I let you go, is there one thing that I could force you to say? Um, no, I don't really, uh, is, I don't know. I mean, is there one thing I could ask you and force you to say? No, I don't think so. What you got? All right. Can you say that, um, the, the experience with working with CCTG brokers are a lot better than working with non CCTG brokers? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, Chris. Absolutely. CCTG is one of the best brokers I've ever worked with. And, um, and that's, and that, that is the truth. There are just too many commercial loan brokers that don't have a damn clue of what they're doing. All we're trying to do here is better the industry for everybody. At the end of the day, you can make great money in this industry, but in the end, it's all about helping people. You know, people always say, Chris, how can I be a successful broker? It's two words, hard work and dedication. If you don't like talking to people, you probably shouldn't be in this business. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Entrepreneurs in Finance. I'm Chris Roglary, where we explore the days and lives and uh, uh, careers of entrepreneurs in finance both uh, brokers from CCTG and lenders that participate in CCTG. And I'm very excited today to um, interview Eric Johnson of North Avenue Capital. Hey, Eric. How are you? Hey, Chris. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Um, you are our second lender that in, that's in our network that uh, has agreed to uh, be interviewed. So I really appreciate your time. Oh, and, thank you for uh, having me. Yeah, and I'll just, I'm going to give you a little kudos. You guys have been phenomenal in working with our brokers. Um, we've got a ton of feedback, a great feedback from our, our, our CCTG brokers. And I just wanted to tell you that to start the interview. You guys do one hell of a job of, uh, uh, you know, servicing our guys and interacting with them. So that's. No, listen, we appreciate it. We, we think highly of the NACLB and, you know, we just, you know, learn about you guys a couple of years ago. We've been all in with you guys as, you know, sponsors on the conferences and I think platinum sponsor this year. And so we've, we've got a lot of deals from your, from your brokers. So we, we appreciate the business. Yeah. And, and, and I appreciate it. Now likewise here and you guys particularly fulfill a good niche that we really didn't have before. Uh, and I knew that existed, but it's not like you could find a ton of lenders that do what you guys do. So, um, not to sound corporate, but you want just giving a quick elevator pitch on what, you know, what do you guys do at North Avenue Capital? Yeah, sure. So North Avenue Capital, we are a specialized USDA business and industry lender. So we're a nationwide lender. And so you know, hopefully what people see when they think rural lender, they think North Avenue Capital, you know, because that's like I said, that's the niche we play in is hey, everybody's chasing the deals and the big MSAs, but nobody's really chasing those deals, you know, in those kind of secondary and tertiary markets. And, and that's the field we play in. Um, you know, we look at loans from 2 million up to 25 million nationwide, all different property sites, different industries. And so it's, we're always looking for, for, for good deals. And so uh, we, we appreciate the opportunity for your brokers to call us. You know, I've got five or six guys that work all over the country that are willing to take your calls and, you know, I do deals myself too. So you can call me and we can figure out a way to try to get a deal done. Yeah, that's, that's good. You know, what's interesting is when I used to think, and I've been in the industry for, you know, 20 plus years, just in various forms of financing. But whenever I, I didn't personally, I didn't have a lot of experience um, with, uh, you, you know, USDA loans, but whenever I would hear about them, I would always think like, for some reason, like crickets would, would uh, uh, I always like, like I have crickets in the back of my mind. Yeah, right. You thought ag. That's that's same. That's same what I thought. You know, when I was in uh, when I was in banking, a, a deal came across my desk. It was a commercial retail center, and the bank president said, "Eric, here's a deal we probably won't ever do. It's a USDA loan." And I thought, USDA, and it's a commercial strip center. What is that? You know, and I, I was about to throw the deal away. Chris, mm -hmm. I almost threw this deal in the trash can. I said, "Well, hold on, let me." And I'd only been at the bank about two weeks, and I said, "Well, hold on, let me look at this thing and see if there's." you know, deal guys like ourselves. Well, Hey, look, there's a deal here. I just got to figure it out. Right. And so I sat there and looked at it and I, there was a broker on there and he said, Hey, you know, if you want to learn more, call me. And so I called him up and he told me about the program and he explained to me it's more, it's, it's more for business, you know, similar to the SBA, but larger and then it's more focused on rural and, and the rest is history. So I closed that loan about two months later and the bank was like, wait a minute, I've never even heard of this stuff. And so we closed it and uh, it was a great deal for the bank. It was a great deal for the borrower. And, I did that for about five years and I said, Hey, I wanted to kind of take it, you know, banking, which I love banking, but 
they're always restricted to their demographics and their geographical area of a 60 mile radius. And I said, man, I, I enjoy helping people. And I wanted to kind of take this show on the road and, Hey, let's go nationwide with it. I, I feel like I can help more people. Um, so we, I started North Avenue about you know, almost six years ago to kind of help rural, rural businesses get access to capital. So that's how it started. Isn't that funny how, I mean, early in my career, I was, I was a banker for about four years of my career until uh, I got let go. And then I said, you know, there's got to be a better way. And I kind of went out on this path. And, and, but I'm not here to talk about me. What's interesting about you is you, here you were a banker, right? Career banker. And, um, you know, you actually, you know, you, you kind of found a niche. You encountered, you know, maybe a niche that you didn't really know about before. And you said, wait a minute, there's got to be a better way to kind of implement this to get capital to people in rural areas. Right. And you saw a challenge and uh, challenge accepted. And here you are today. I mean, I, that's, that's, uh, I, I would call you a reform banker. We're all reform bankers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, just uh, to kind of dovetail what you just said, I got laid off as well. So that, you know, okay. I, I just started at bank two weeks. I worked for a big life insurance company and the, the financial crisis, obviously, you know, if you're in lending, everybody took a hit. And so, you know, I moved back in 2008. Yeah, 2008. So 2008, 2009. So 2009 is when I left, you know, um, life company lending and moved to kind of banking. And it was new for me. And, you know, but commercial real estate was my background. It was my expertise. And so that deal came across, you know, again, I've only been at the bank two weeks. And I was about to show these guys how to do uh, CRE deals, right? So that's, kind of roll my sleeves up and end up doing that. So it was a, it was a great opportunity I and mean, I'm glad, you know, the president of the bank gave me that loan, even though I said, Eric, we're never going to do it. But had he never given me that loan, I almost threw it in the trash can. I probably wouldn't be sitting here today talking about uh, USDA lending. So. And I got to imagine, I mean, you know, you're in the field, you see that you, you, you see deals all day, but you know, for a lot of the brokers out there, I mean, I can't imagine, or I could only imagine how many brokers throw away these deals because they just don't, I mean, they see, okay, out in the middle of nowhere business. I don't have anything for this. My lenders are not going to do this because a lot of lenders only like the major MSAs, right? I call them the football. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we get calls all the time and that's, and that's what I, again, like when you think rural lending or rural deals, like I hope your brokers, everybody say, well, Hey, that's North Avenue. Like if you got a rural deal, call North Avenue. Before you throw that deal away, just give me a call or give one of my guys a call and let's, yeah. let's see if there's a fit there. Because, yeah, most people just think, hey, I, I don't have the time. I don't really have the resources of the lenders, you know, at my disposal right. to go chase this deal. Where, hey, you know, again, big MSAs, you've got a dozen or so lenders all chasing this deal. So it's uh, it's yeah. definitely a, a super small niche that we're we're hopefully one of the great ones at. And I mean, I think, I think you guys already established that brand. I mean, at least, you know think of USDA, you think of North Avenue Capital, which is, you know, great, a great effort and branding on your part. Um, how many brokers do you find get USDA confused with SBA? 100%. I mean, every, every phone call is like, hey, so this is an SBA. And so the, the, there are a lot of similarities, but there's also a lot of differences. And so every conversation, it, you know, again, through the CCTG, we try to educate brokers and explain to them the advantages of the USDA. Uh, but, and the SBA. So I'm not saying don't do it, but there's a lot of deals, you know, again, there's a five million SBA cap, right? So right. a lot of these rural deals, big manufacturing plants, light distribution, well, they need seven, eight, 10, $15 million. And you know, you can't get an SBA loan. It's only 5 million. So it's, it's just definitely another opportunity, another Avenue. If you're in the government guaranteed lending space, mm -hmm. you definitely need to learn about USDA because I mean, you can actually patch them up, pair pursue, so you can do a $10 million USDA, $5 million SBA. We did one of those uh, last year on a, a big nursery up in Maryland. Nice. So it was a $15 million. So, so there's always different ways to skin the cat to try to try to figure out a way to get the deal done. Yeah, and, you know, I, I don't want to go to this immediately, but everybody that's probably going to watch this, uh, future CCTG brokers and current ones, they all want to know one thing. How much can I make, right? How much – that's all. that all sounds good, and if I concentrate it – so. Tell me about, I mean, since these are larger deals, I think it's, they're, they're very, very profitable for a broker should they concentrate on this, I would assume, right? Yeah, I mean, they get anywhere from one to two points, sometimes three. It just depends how good they are. Um, and see, that's, that's the beauty of the USDA is you're allowed to charge origination fees, you know, where the SBA, you're not really allowed to charge origination fees. And so they have these small packaging uh, fees and they, they try to work out some kind of side deal or 
deal once it's closed with the bank to pay them maybe a portion of their premium or something like that. Yeah. Um, we're on the USA. It's all on the front end. So yeah, we, we, we kind of bake that into the loan amount, you know, typically 1%. Um, you know, and we're talking 15, $25 million deals. That's, that's a nice payday for these guys. Yeah, that's a big, nice payday. Yeah. And that's what, that's what I find your product and what you guys do most fascinating because no one really knows it exists in the brokerage world or they, they've heard about it, but they think like, oh man, that's for farms, you know, yeah. uh, um, or that's some obscure unit of the SBA. Um, but not realizing that it's not like that. It's for a lot of businesses, particularly in rural areas, and they can make a hell of a lot of money, you know, focusing on it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, again, it's USDA, so people automatically think agriculture, but yeah, let's, you know, there's also, I mean, there's a lot of deals we work on where, you know, there's, you've seen it, there's two or three brokers chasing this one deal. And so when you can have, Maybe you work in, hey, get a point, two points, and you know you can pay your referral broker. You know, so there's everyone can get fed on these deals um, if we structure them right. So sure, sure, yeah. You're speaking of broker chains. I hate broker chains. <laughs> me too. As a blender, I hate me too. I got to do it right now. Someone's gonna make quarter million dollars, and we got brokers fighting on how much money they're gonna make on this quarter million dollar fee. Um, there's two brokers fighting on it. You know, so it's. Things like that makes you like, wait, I'm putting all the money out and, you know, doing all the work and, you know, yeah. I, mean, I appreciate the brokers, but it's, you know, I'd yeah. like to know on the front end if there's multiple brokers there, you know, so, but I'll see it. It'll get all worked out, but yeah, if we yeah. could uh, limit that to, to one, it'd be great and kind of just focus your time with those guys. But Well, more. I got to be honest with you, Eric. I mean, I own a, a real estate lending company ourselves here, Prime, and uh, we have a policy that if we find out there's more than one broker involved, we don't even take on the transaction. I mean, oh, really? I've seen these things like nine, 10 deep. And it's like, <laughs> I, I, you'd be surprised. Yeah. Like I've, I've had calls where like people are like, no, it's a good deal. Mark Cuban's involved. And it's like, <laughs> really? And, and, and then like, so in my younger days, I used to roll with it and, and go, all right, well you can get Mark Cuban on the phone. Oh yeah. And then all of a sudden you get on the phone and it's like, no Mark Cuban, obviously. And it's like, who are you? And it's like, well, I'm Mark Cuban's representative or I'm a friend of Mark Cuban's. Re and it's just all yeah. bullshit. You know? Yeah. And so. Uh, yeah, no, it's uh, it definitely is frustrating, especially when you don't find out on the front end that there's multiple people. Cause you know, as you get close to closing, you, they don't really pop their heads up until you get close to closing. And then all of a sudden they start, pop, Hey, well, Hey, I, I was part of that deal. And Hey, I was part of that deal. And whoa, whoa. Now you got three or four. Yeah. All trying to you know, one piece of the pie, you know, and so it's um, at the end of the day, you know, you probably don't. I mean, one thing we do in the course is we teach etiquette and, and we actually cover that. Don't get involved in broker chains and be direct with the client because it's a mess. And at the end of the day, that broker, I would assume not you naming names, but, you know, when you deal with a broker that way, that brings that mess into a transaction and could potentially jeopardize it. It kind of tarnishes the broker's reputation, at least in my opinion. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, kind of, hey, I I don't know if I'll, you know, if I sends me another deal, then you, you know, you're kind of gun shy. I think, well, hey man, how many brokers deep is this deal? You know, is there another two or three that I've got to pay? You know, I agree to pay this guy. And so I'm not really agreeing to pay anybody else. And so it's, you know, so it's, I was kind of, maybe we might need to get to that where, hey, if there's a broker chain, we're out. But you know, what I've kind of taken the posture of, hey, well, I agree to pay you this and you can figure it out with whoever else down the chain, but it's just coming out of your feet. So that's, yeah. that's how I do it. Um, you know, one thing that when kind of reading a little bit about North Avenue Capital, when I, I guess I was exposed to you guys at our, our conference, the NACLB, and, um, it made sense to put you in our network at CCTG because it was a void that we had. But one of the things that impressed me the most is the growth you guys had. I mean, you guys have had one, how, how long you guys have been around for? We've been around uh, six years. So this is, uh, this is our sixth year and we're hoping to try to be the number one lender in the country. So we'll on the USDA side. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're shooting for that goal. We'll, we'll find out here in a month or two if we made it. Um, but yeah, we've, we've been hustling, man. I mean, I've, I've got a great team around me. Uh, obviously I, I produce loans as well, but I, I've got a great group of lenders and, you know, you know, Jason Hare, he actually teaches the CCTG and I'll give out, I'll give shouts out to Jason because Jason's the one that found the NACLB. So he Jason's came back when we came on, you know, I guess two years ago, he said, Hey, yeah. I, I, like, I like to go to this conference and, uh, and so we started going to it and he was he said he was already uh, teaching classes at the CCTG. So, yeah, I mean, kudos to him for, for finding you guys and uh, bringing you guys up to us and to North Avenue. So, I mean, you guys have been a great partner and we, we appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. You know, Jay, and I, I just got to say, Jason's great. 
I mean, he, he has a great way of presenting the product and, and getting people to understand it. So uh, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, yeah. So what would you attribute the growth to North Avenue? I mean, you guys are doing something right and only being in, you know, only being around for six years and you're on track to be the largest USDA lender. I mean, that's gotta be exciting. Yeah, it is. You know, so I'll see. We're not there yet. So we'll, we'll see, but you know, I would attribute to you just, you know, communication and customer service. You know, I tell all my guys, Hey, look, you know, that was one thing that I really, just one of my big pet peeves and, and really just in my career is just non-communication. You know, we, we do a lot of banks they are, you know, they're non-committal, you know, I always compare them, a fair amount told them, you know, I hate to say this, but they're, they're like turtles, right? They don't like to stick their necks out and they're super slow. Yeah. Not all bankers are like that, but a good majority are. And so there's no real incentive for these guys to go do deals. And so, you know, they would just won't call you back, right? If you got a tough deal or something they're not, you know, maybe it's on the fence. Well, they'll not call, they won't call you back or, you know, they'll take three, four weeks. And so what I tell my guys, hey, look, either we're going to do that deal and we're going to let these guys know in, you know, 24, 48 hours that there's a deal here. And if it's not, look, like, let's cut them loose and let's move on. You know, people appreciate the honesty and the transparency so they can go try to find capital elsewhere. So that's that's what I try to drive in my guys. And, hey, let's, and do what we say. You know, we don't, you know, especially as, you know, what we call a non-traditional lender. We're not a bank that, you know, there's this, you know, there's this, Kind of in the market of just hey people think well hey they're not a bank they're going to bait and switch me right they, there's this misconception of well hey they're they're crooked and they're just trying to get my money and, and hey there's a ton of these lenders out there right i'm sure you've run into it they're really in it just to get the fees up front and they never really have any intention of ever closing that loan yeah and we're hey we're i tell hey look we 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 want we don't need the practice we want to close the loan so we're not in it for the little application or underwriting fee on the front end that's just something we know to kind of keep your, you know, put some skin in the game for the borrower that's saying, Hey, we'll, we want to see this thing through the end. It takes a lot of time, but you know, if you could do that, communicate well and just, and you know, certainty of execution and tell them, Hey, look, if this is the term sheet we're going to give you. This is what we're closing on. You know, I, I feel like that's gone a long way with borrowers that they appreciate that the honesty and knowing that, Hey, they're not going to get, you know, right there at the, at the closing table, you know, get retraded. That happens all the time. Oh my God. We refinance a lot of deals that, hey, this deal was going to close two weeks ago and the bank retraded the deal on me and I walked away. And I said, oh, well, listen, we're not going to do that to you. And here's our terms and let's let's go get it done. You know, so I, there, there's, you know, I'm, I'm super blessed to have the, the team around me that, that do what they do. These guys are Jason, Ben Matthewson, Tyler Jordan. I mean, these guys are really working hard to try to put loans uh, on the books for us. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, and there's just too many lenders. I wish all lenders were like that, to be honest with you. Just, Cut yeah. to the, you know, just cut to the point, be honest, be straightforward, not, you know, well, you know, charge this on, you know, non-refundable upfront fee and, you know, due diligence fee and all of a sudden nothing closes at the end. Um, you know what, you know what, you know, uh, something you said earlier, what I want to come back to, and I think it's great because you're one of the only people I've met that does kind of the same thing that I do. And so for instance, I'm a big proponent on complacency is the killer of businesses, right? I mean, that, that, that's the death of a lot of companies. They get too complacent, they become a leader and they get soft and fat and happy, right? One of the things that you said is that, look, here you are, one of the founders of the company, but it, it, you, know, you said, look, once in a while, I'll jump in a deal. I'll do a deal myself. And I find that so, so intriguing because it's rare. I do the same thing. I mean, one of the things that we get a lot of leads here and once in a while, and I have a lot of reps to, you know, that, that, that goes out to, but I'll jump into a deal just to keep my kind of chops wet, right? Because as bankers, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you banker to banker. I, there's an old saying in banking, at the least that I've grown to know, the longer you're in banking, the stupider you get. Meaning, <laughs> so like you're here. You he said that, not me. <laughs> okay, no, I'll take credit for it, but... And I don't mean what you and I do now. I'm talking about if you're a banker. And what I mean by that, and you probably have friends like this. I have friends like this. They start out here at the ground level, right? They're, and and they're, they're hunters. They're out, they're out there. They're, they're getting deals. They're, they're, they're doing a lot of extracurricular activities. They're not just calling on depositors. They're going outside of the bank and trying to get in business. The problem is they get good, and then they get promoted. And you see what's happening? They're, they're moving away from what made them great in the first place. They get promoted, they get fat and happy, and then they lose that instinct. They lose yeah. that like hunter instinct. And one of the, that's one of the reasons why every month I take a couple of deals and 
kind of work in myself and I just say, hey, I'm not the CEO. I say, hey, I'm a business development officer of Prime Commercial Lending. It sounds like you do the same thing. I love that. You want to talk about that? Is that why you do it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love helping people. And I, you know, again, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in leading by example and, you know, and competition breeds excellence. And so when they see, you know, the, the president and founder of the company producing $80 million of our hundred million, well, I know, you know, Jason and Ben and Tyler think, I need to start getting to work here because this guy's out producing me. Right. And so, I mean, so mm -hmm. to me, it, it, it motivates these guys to say, Hey, I got to go out there and produce. And two, like he said, it keeps me knowledgeable of what's going on. And I love, you know, that's one of the great things of being in the deal business is all the business you know, owners you meet, CEOs, CFOs that you kind of interact with on a daily basis is, man, those, I enjoy meeting new people and just learning about their business and what they do and how they got to where they're at. And so I, you know, I, like I said, as a banker, you get promoted, well, you're out of the weeds and you, you never get into deals anymore. And I, I enjoy being deal. I love going on the road and, and meeting these customers and, you know, them telling us about the business and hopefully helping them close the deal. And so, um, yeah, I'm, you know, I've always, ever since we, I started North Avenue with two partners, so I've been in doing deals every year. Um, so uh, as we grow and hire more lenders, I'm, I'll probably back up and not do as many, but right now I'm going to be number one. And, you know, yeah, when it's fourth down and fourth quarter, who you want the ball at, the, put the ball in the guy's hand that wants to win. So I want to win. So I'm yeah. giving me the ball. <laughs> so I want to hey, just over the finish line and try to get us number one spot. So. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, it kind of makes for a really good sales meeting when you have your sales meetings and, you know, you're, you're leading the pack and here you are the founder of the company. It kind of puts everybody, it forces everybody to rise up and come yeah. on, game time. Like you gotta, you gotta bring your best. That's right. So, um, and I, I see it, I, you know, these guys have gotten really, you know, they, they're chasing a bunch of deals and, you know, signing up a bunch. And so it's, it does definitely competition breeds excellence. I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. So I, I enjoy doing it. And I, I think it's, it's good for North Avenue and it's good for the USDA and it's good for the brokers because we're looking at a ton of deals. So, yeah. Yeah. There's nothing more gratifying than a lender looking to do deals. I mean, you know, there's a lot of pretenders out there that, you know, like I said, we talked about that, that you know, get yeah. involved in the upfront fees. There's no action. It's just uh, kind of pretend stuff. Starting North Avenue. Was that your first entrepreneurial endeavor? It was, it was. So my background, um, you know, I was in, I was always been in finance. Um, you know, I knew I wanted to be in finance. So I got my MBA in finance at Georgia. I was a business major at the Citadel and I just knew that, Hey, I wanted to get in finance to, to kind of learn the business. And so I've always kind of been on the lending side. Um, I worked for big corporations, you know, ING was my first kind of finance gig. And then again, working for a, a local community bank. And I just realized that, you know, I was about 10, 15 years of that. I thought, Hey, I'm, I'm ready to kind of go out there. And, you know, again, like I alluded to earlier is that, you know, every, every financial institution has this kind of parameters and benchmark of deals they want to do. And I just, I felt like a lot of times I was kind of restricted. Oh, man, if I, if I made these parameters, I would be doing this, this, and this, and I would go try to help more people. And, you know, in banking, which, you know, you've seen it that, you know, the ML in banking is that, Hey, let's give money to people who don't need money. Right. And the people that really need money don't get the money. Because, hey, it's, that's too much work and it's too much risk. And it, it always disappointed me that, man, that's, that's the whole reason banking and you know, all this stuff was created is for you guys to put capital out to these small business owners. But it, as a bank, so, well, hey, we want to kind of keep our camels rating, you know, one or two. And so we don't really want to take that added risk. And so there's, there's been a lot of restriction on lending. And honestly, that's why North Avenue Capital is here. Because if banks were lending like they should, then I wouldn't be here. And you know, North Avenue wouldn't be in a position to hopefully be one of the top lenders in the country. So we're, we're, we're definitely, I mean, it is what it is with banking. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you're going to change that MO. That's just the way no. they're, they're, they are. Did you um, have doubters? Did you have doubters when you said, Hey, here's what I'm going to do. Did you have people say like, Oh man, you're crazy. Like, oh yeah. I mean, I'll say, I, you know, I, I went to my two partners and tell them, Hey, you know, we, I was, we were doing private equity deals and I went to my partner and said, Hey, I, I've got this opportunity here. I think we need to pursue that how about we just be our own lender and instead of, you know, structuring these meds deals and all this very complicated structures with debt and equity, I said, you know, if we're looking at a lot of these kind of secondary tertiary market deals, you know, we could be a USDA B and I lender and be the actual lender and the economics are that much better and we control it versus just being right. on the, on the on PE side and, you know, being one deal for three to five years. And so it was, uh, you know, it took some, it took some uh, convincing just my own internally, my two partners were like, well, what is this? I never even heard of that. You know, like what is the USDA? You know, everyone's heard of SBA. And so I, 
I kind of <laughs> arm landing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so that was the first stage is just getting my partners on board. Like, man, that is, I didn't know this program was even out there. I was like, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I've been doing this for five years at the bank and, um, and then the next step was really to go train or just educate investors. You know, um, we're a private equity firm and we raise capital to get started and, you know, just educating investors of, Hey, this is a real program. It's been around 70, 80 years and we're, you know, we're going to be a part of it. And here's where we're at. And, you know, five, six years, you know, we want to be the number one lender in the country. Um, you know, so, I mean, North Abbey's been there for six years. It took us a year to just kind of get going, but for actually doing deals, it's only been five years. And then our business plan, we put it hey, within five years, we want to be the number one lender in the country. And so this would be the fifth year. So I'm, I'm really pushing hard to hit that goal. Uh, um, and so, yeah, it was, that was kind of the start of it all. And then, you know, we also got them to, to willing to take a chance on myself and my two partners to start North Avenue Capital and, Again, the rest is history. We've just been working hard and growing. It started with the three amigos, if you will, and now we've got <laughs> almost 20 employees, you know, nationwide. So it's been, uh, it's been a great ride. So uh, I definitely oh. enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, I, I know what that's like. I mean, I know at one point in my career, I owned a factoring company, mm -hmm. and um, we did non-recourse factoring, and we eventually sold it to a bank. But um, I remember when I first started that, I remember when I was at the bank, people used to, like bankers used to say, oh, man, that's for companies that are like, next to going out of business and i'm like what? And, and 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 you know and then when i actually started a factoring company and grew it it's like i always remember somebody saying that to me and it's like no man it's for companies that are doing this you know yeah. and, and, and you know a lot of times people too what i've realized you know even when i just wanted other friends and you know co-workers of just hey i want to go start my own business um you know there's always doubters and i've realized a lot of people it's almost kind of a, a jealous like well hey we don't really want him to do well so let's just tell them hey you can't work like your guy you're saying hey that's not really you know because if, if it was easy everybody would be doing it right and so sure. to go out on your own and, and start a business I mean it's hard and so you know you're always going to have people even in your inner circle some people might say hey you sure you want to do that and like that's going to be you know you may go out of business you may not work and well hey yeah that that is that is a possibility and guess what I can always come back banking <laughs> you're not going anywhere so well, what is that though so. You ever sit back and think, why is that? I mean, that, that's like a human, that's like a, almost like a human trait. It, like, does it feel better to tell somebody, oh, you're, you're going to fail and that's a bad idea than say, congratulations, man, good luck. Like, I don't know. I'm always the opposite. When someone tells you they're going to do something, I'm like, great, man. You yeah, know, like, hey, any, any way I can help you, let me know, man. I'd love to see you be successful. But I think, yeah, I think that is human. Most, not most, not all people, but I think most people, it's the, it's kind of that, you know, hey, I, I want to be that person, but I'm not. And so by me telling you. poo-poo like, on your idea. Yeah, they, yeah, it's not my idea. It's yours. And, I, you know, maybe I don't want to tell you how great you're going to do because I almost kind of want you to just kind of be content with me right here in the bank and stay here for 20 years and <laughs> live your life in the bank. And Yeah. You know, that's not, yeah. You know, I wish I, I appreciate the guys at the bank and they gave me the opportunity. And um, yeah. so there, there's no hard feelings there. But, you know, again, it's just you know, something I wanted to do. And again, I, I think you're just going to, whatever business you get into, you're always going to have naysayers trying to say, Hey, yeah, sure you want to do that? You know, you can fail. Well, we could fail at anything. So you never know. Until you try. I, and I, you know, I'm a big proponent of what's kept me. One of the philosophies that's kept me going is I think one of the biggest tragedies in life is looking back and saying, what if I, I'd yeah. rather actually do something and fail at it then at least when I can look back and say, you know what, I, I tried it and I failed. But what, kill, what would eat me inside is just always wondering in my life, gee, I wonder if that would have worked out. Yeah, no, listen, I, I'm 100, man, I, we're, we're very similar. That's, that's how I tell my kids. I, now, I remember growing up, one of my biggest regrets in high school is, you know, I, I love playing football, but, you know, I was a military brat, so I moved around a lot. And when I moved to South Georgia, you know, everyone, all the naysayers, hey, you'll never get to play football. You know, you didn't grow up here. You didn't play peewee football you're never going to be able to play. And, you know, so they taught me out of it. And so I just played soccer, but I mean, I really love football. Like that was my, yeah. I loved it, but you know, and I always tell my kids now, like, look, I, mean, I regret that to this day. I didn't at least try. I and mean, that was four years or I, you know, I could have played high school football and who knows what would happen, but I didn't because I, I let people talk me out of it. You know? And so yeah. I always tell my kids, Hey, just try everything. And if it doesn't work, at least, you know, you tried and you'll never regret not trying. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's, that's what I try to do. God, Joe, it's so refreshing talking to uh, an entrepreneur. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, yeah. it's, it's refreshing.
<laughs> um, so you mentioned a pretty cool thing. So you played football. What, what position did you play? I was actually a, I was a tackle. Uh, I, I played growing up. I was, you know, I was, I was kind of a big guy, a little, but you know, I'm not in middle school. I, you know, I moved here, I moved to Georgia in seventh grade. And so that's when it kind of all started. Of, like I played, you know, kind of elementary football to middle school. And then when I moved here in seventh grade is when like, Hey, you can't play. It's, you know, you got to know people down here and it's all, you know, and my son plays football now. It's super political of oh, sure. the way kids get to play and, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, so, I, you know, again, I taught myself, but I love playing on the line. You know, my brother is only a year older than me. So I was right tackle. He was left tackle. And, you know, we were kind of the big guy. So when you're young, you're like, hey, you're the biggest guy. So stand <laughs> on the line, you know, like, wait, I want to be a, I want to be a tight end. I want to catch the ball. And, you know, you yeah. just kind of do what they wanted you to do, but. No, See for I me, I was I was a wide receiver. I mean, I look okay. like it now, but I used to, I was I was quick, I was nimble, but I didn't I didn't want to be like they stuck me there. Like I I actually wanted to be like either quarterback or I wanted to be, you know, I I actually wanted to be on a line because you didn't get hit as much. And yeah. and when they stuck me in that wide receiver position because I was one of the fastest kids, I was like shit. <laughs> I, think, I think that's why, at least in middle school and you know high school, I I excelled a little bit because I didn't want to get hit. So that just poison to run faster you know what i mean just run fast that's that's Herschel walker right that was his little deal hey I, these kids i'm just gonna be bigger faster stronger and i'll yeah. i'll outrun all these guys and and the wind and the heisman yeah so what, yeah it was, uh, it was a bit different what uh what team did you uh aspire to in the nfl like what like who did you follow um you know it's funny growing up i was a redskins fan because my dad we lived up in, in maryland near dc and then i moved to georgia in seventh grade and then you know it was funny i, I kind of just quit liking pro ball and I was all about Georgia football I mean I just fell in love with, with the Bulldogs and just wanted to you know man I loved the Georgia Bulldogs and being part of that and you know yeah you know, the, I got you know I'm a season ticket holder. I go to all the games and I take my son and so I, I'm a big college football guy so it's funny I'm not really into the pros as much when I was younger as, as I got a little bit older I was just all about college ball so yeah yeah well growing up see I grew up like my my era was like the whole Dan Marino era yeah, yeah. Dolphins. And my dad was an old school, like, like the old school Dolphins, like Don Shula, Larry Zonka, yeah. you know, perfect team and that era. So I, you know, I followed the Dolphins for a while, but you know, they. Yeah. I think my generation in the eighties and I mean, I love, everybody loves, you know, Joe Montana, right. He was winning all the Super Bowls, and then, uh, you know, John Elway, you know, in the late nineties. And, uh, but yeah, it was, I think everybody was a 49ers or Cowboys uh, fan or maybe the Broncos too a little bit with with Elway and then the Redskins you know with Doug Williams they won the Super Bowl and, yeah uh, but yeah I think it was just whoever was winning the the Super Bowls everybody was was for and then you know there's there an old there's an old saying I mean you know Dan Marino was my guy and um, there's an old saying you know you know you know you, you know what the difference is between Joe Montana and Dan Marino what's that Joe Montana had a team Dan Marino was the team. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, think of all the the blue chip players they had with Jerry Rice. I mean, golly, yeah. he he had it. Um, yeah, Marino yeah. was all by himself, and yeah, every play, play get there. Every, every play is a pass play. It's yeah, the Super Bowl uh, with you I know Marcy. Yeah, yeah, he'd be running back for the for the Dolphins. <laughs> he just <laughs> all right. We're gonna fake it to you, and then we're gonna throw. We're gonna fake it to you, and we're gonna throw. <laughs> yeah. Um. You got to be excited about NACLB, even though we are virtual this year because we had to. But Joe Theismann, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, that was. I know I was looking. I was, so your your keynote speakers are just they're phenomenal. Like you know, my first one I went to was last year, and that's when I really got. I was talking to Scott. I really got sold on NACLB. I'm like, man, this is this is great. And had the Navy SEAL, yeah. all from the military school. I love the. Yeah, I remember deal with the Navy SEALs that shot up uh, some of the lot. I was, oh man, I love to hear this guy's story. You know, and that guy, and he was just, you know, that's what I love. He just seemed like a regular old guy that just you go have a beer with, and yeah, yeah, he's snipered off with some and shot him in the head. You know, man, I love that guy. <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> he it was, said it so cool. Oh yeah, I went in there, <laughs> kill him, and it yeah, was yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's exactly that was it was the best, and I got to know him a little bit just from the conference, and and we hung out a little bit, and. Really, really laid back, good dude. Like, yeah. really, really cool dude. And he, right. uh, yeah, I think the NACB is great. You know, I mean, obviously, you guys have been around, but it sounds like you guys kind of got going right when the NAC started going. Was this your fifth, sixth year or something? Sixth year. Like 
be six years. Yeah. 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 So you're kind of right around the same time. And, you know, again, just you know, kudos to you, right? I mean, think of how many conferences are out there for, for mortgage bankers. And yet, hey, I just said, hey, I'm going to go start another one. I'm going to start well, CLB. And, you know, what our biggest, my biggest, so the naysayers with that were, because my whole philosophy is, look, as a broker, you got to be diversified today. You got to know more. You got to be that, that all around consultant to kind of fit a product in what the client needs. And I said, I'm going to start a conference where I put all different lenders in a room and, and brokers will come. And I had everybody said, you're nuts. You know, you're nuts putting a North Avenue Capital with an equipment finance letter next to a factoring lender. It's never going to happen. I'm like, oh, I think it will. I think it will. People, a lot of brokers crave other products to make money. And, and here we are, the largest loan broker conference in the country. So there you go. Yeah. I, I, was, I was speaking uh, with a factoring lender on one of your presentations. And so like, right. here is the rural lender, you know, more kind of real estate and equipment. And then I'm with a, you know, kind of an AR lender. And yeah. but hey, I got a couple of deals from that, just that one meeting people came up. So yeah, it's, I think, you know, like you said, you got to be able to know a bunch of different things to, to, to be successful in this business. And, you know, and yeah. with us, you know, again, like we're not just a hotel lender. We're not a right you know, a, an office lender or a retail. I mean, we, we, you got to kind of know a little bit of every business, right? And sure. Item and um, I'm looking at a hospital right now. I've never done a hospital, but I'm yeah, at the hospital deal right now. So we, you know, we're willing to you know kind of roll our sleeves up and learn. Is uh, that's the key. Well, and and I think I think just as one entrepreneur to another, you got to be diversified. Uh, that was my philosophy and our brokers actually realized how important that was doing. So we started in 09 CCTG and yeah. our brokers never really had a turn, a, a turn down, but then COVID hit. Right. And we found guys that didn't even care about SBA. They knew it cause they were taught it here. They had resources, but they did like fix and flip loans or they just did real estate loans or investment real estate. Right. Yeah. CMBS loans. They all of a sudden had it when that shut down temporarily, they had a morph to continue on making money. And so what did they do? They graduated toward PPP. And um, our guys put together over $200 million worth of PPP loans, the CCT wow. graduates, because that's great. That, that was where the product went, right? And that's for that, that was where the need was. So they adapted very well where other brokers probably, you know, couldn't do that because they just didn't know any better. Yeah. yeah you always got to be learning and learning new things. And, you know, like, that's the beauty of de the deal of business too, right? I mean, you know, this, every deal is different. So I haven't done, I've never done the same deal twice, right? It's a different industry, different bar, different economics, different structures. So I, I mean, I've learned something new on every deal. Yeah. I've, right. been, I've been in lending for 15, 17 years now. And it, I mean, every deal is so different and that's, that's, what's great. And you got to be willing to adapt and learn these new things and, you know, that and you're like, sure. okay, well, learn that on that deal. So hopefully, I can apply it for another deal. And you're always using things you learn on other deals to yeah. uh, tricks and techniques to structure new deals. Absolutely. Um, all right, you ready? You ready to be to uh, put on a hot seat here? I'll ask you some quirky questions. Yeah, man, go ahead. <laughs> Got it. All right, all right. Um, if you weren't in finance, North Avenue Capital didn't exist. You didn't get your MBA. You didn't do any of that. What do you think you'd be doing? Man, you know, my ultimate goal is to be a commercial real estate developer. Like that has been since I was probably high school that man, I'd love to be a, a real estate developer. I just always looked like, man, this, this is neat. And you know, it's funny getting into real estate development. Everyone always told me, Hey, you can't ever get in development unless you know the, you know, the finance side. And so if you know the finance side, once you get in development, you'll be twice as good as these guys that don't really know how to structure deals and know it's fun. So so that's what I've been doing ever since, you know, 10, 15 years is learning finance. But I, I loved it so much of helping people that I ain't quite gone around to help myself and, and learn <laughs> to be the developer yet. But that, that'd be, if I wasn't uh, running North Avenue Capital, that would be my, my kind of dream job is to be my own kind of real estate developer and developing projects. Well, now you, the, now you definitely know the finance side. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Awesome. That's cool. Um, what's, you know, so what's, Somebody just looking at Eric Johnson that doesn't really, that, that wouldn't really know something about you, yourself just by reading your bio or just looking at you. Um, yeah. One of the things, you know, you're asking, so I'm going to tell you. So, um, you know, I always try to tell people anytime I get any type of you know, interviews or anything like that, that, Hey, if I can do it, anybody can do it. You know, I came from a pretty, pretty troubled background. You know, I almost went to juvie when I was about 13 years old, got in some trouble, hanging around some bad kids, um, you know, didn't do well in high school because I was hanging around some bad kids and 
And my mother always told me, hey, look, my parents are divorced. My dad was an alcoholic. And so my mom said, hey, Eric, if you educate yourself, you can do anything you want to do. You know, to me, that was in, in ninth grade. That was kind of my, I almost went to GV for getting in trouble for a bunch of stuff. And that was kind of my, you know, my, my chance in life for, hey, you either go this way. Right. Go down this path and get into trouble, may end up in jail one day, or hey, I get my together and start, you know, educating myself, focusing on school, and you know, the sky's the limit, you know. And so I, so I, I come from kind of a rough background, and you know, and so you know, a lot of people say, oh man, you started this company, you probably had all this money. No, I didn't have anything. Like trust I, fun, trust I didn't fun. have nothing. So I basically came from nothing and trying to basically make it, you know. And I'm, I, I haven't made it. I'm trying to make it, you know. And so. So I always want to tell people that when they, they I don't know anything about you. Hey, look, I, I didn't come from a lot of money to, to get to where I am. Like I, I got here or where I'm at by just working hard and having a good work ethic and, and educating myself, you know, kind of go back to what you and I talked about. Hey, you always yeah. got to be learning and learning something new. And so that to me was like the big thing that kind of propelled me to where I'm at today is I'd always challenging myself and wanting to learn new things to, to kind of get out of the, the rut. And, you know, I tell my son and my daughter every day is that, hey, you already hang around. So if you hang around bad people, you're going to be bad. I mean, that's just, you know, so I, again, one of the keys to leadership is surround yourself by people smarter, smarter than you. And, and that's what I've done. I mean, my two partners are smarter than me. Uh, you know, the, my, one of my best friends from high school is Ben Chatra. He's my, we made him the CEO and he's a Harvard MBA, right? I mean, so if you're going to run a business, you're a deal guy. Well, you surround yourself with people smarter than you that, you know, I mean, I trust that guy. And so he's, He's a Harvard MBA graduate, graduate top of his class. I know him since we were in high school. And um, so that's that's what I try to do is just surround myself with people that are better than me and good influence on my life. And um, so that's what I try to do yeah. you know, in the professional world and also in the personal world with my wife wow. and kids. Wow, Joe, I like this guy. I, Eric, you and I have similar backgrounds, man. <laughs> it's amazing. I, listen, hear you talk. I mean – a lot more than you think, particularly what you said. I mean, listen, I feel like, I mean, come on, like, you know, we both played football. I think like everybody's that close to maybe going to juvie, right? I mean, we all, we've all did something in high school. Or, but I, I was real close, Chris. I don't know. I was real close. I, my mom had to pull some strings, so they didn't send me. And she, yeah. she did nails. Yeah. She, she knew the guy and she basically said, Hey, look, you just give him a second chance. And yeah, luckily yeah. he did it for him. But, uh, uh there's, we got a lot of similar. I'd love to sit down and have a beer with you one day. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, get out of this virtual, man. I'll come in the next yeah. couple where we can I'll come uh, out I, You, you know, a, a lot of people, you know what's crazy? When you get very successful, a lot of people assume, oh, you're a trust fund baby or That's right. you did this or that. And I came from a very impoverished background myself. Um, and actually, I'm a college dropout. So, you know, it's it, you get that stigma a lot. But I, I'm proud to say that, you know, I didn't. I like telling people I didn't come from money. I didn't come yeah. nearly yeah. Not close to money. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I, I, I don't do it to brag, to tell people, Hey, yeah. I, I do it. just kind of like you that, Hey, I, I want people to know like what we talked about earlier that, Hey, if I can do it, you can too. Like I want to be those guys saying, Hey man, look what Eric did. Look what he's trying to do. Yeah. If Eric can do that, man, I don't have half the stuff. He's, or I've got more background, more experience and I can do it. You know? So that, that's what I try to, portray to people when they ask me, hey, look, if I can do it, anybody can. I'm not the smartest guy out there, but I, right. I do work hard and I believe in, you know, getting the job done and finishing yeah. really, you know, so. Um, I, I totally believe in surrounding yourself with people that are smarter than you. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> what one of the companies we have here, we have a couple companies here. We have a digital marketing company, the Finance Marketing Group, and I'm mm -hmm. probably the only digital marketing owner or CEO that doesn't have a Facebook account. I couldn't even tell you how to set up one. But I have, I have people around here that, you're smarter than me at that stuff. Right, so. that's, that's how you do it. <laughs> um, all right, last question for you is, you know, if you could sit down and have an hour or two with a person, uh, dead or alive, who would it be? Um, it would be my father. You know, I, I talked to earlier, he was an alcoholic. You know, he actually passed away about five years ago from, you know, he basically just drank himself to death. And, um, you know, looking back, I, you know, I don't know if you heard that song cats in the cradle, but that was always a song that when he it played, he always teared up because he knew like he had basically done that with hit with me and my, my brother and sister. And, you know, his dad had done the same to him. And I, and I look back those last five years, I mean, I should have, you know, these last five years, I reflect on, oh, man, I, 
I should have spent more time with him, even though, you know, he was, he had, he had a disease and, you know, but, you know, as a father with, with, with two young kids, I was like, man, I don't want my kids around and seeing that. But then I also think, man, I didn't really get, maybe I could have helped him, you know, maybe I could have, maybe kind of, you know, but, you know, he was, he's been an alcoholic his whole life, but, you know, ever since he was probably in the military, but, you know, you just look back like, man, if I had to spend more time, you only have one father and, you know, I wish I could have said, Dad, you know, let's, what can I do to help you? And I, I tried to, you know, and towards the end there, when my kids started getting a little bit older and they started noticing things, I was like, ah, I just, I don't really want them around that. And, uh, and so I regret it, you know, and I'll say he, he passed away, unfortunately. And, um, you know, yeah, I, that. I always look back, you know, if I could have some more time with him and sit down with him over lunch and just really try to dive into his, his brain of like, Hey, how can I help you, man? Or like, what can I do to, you know, I love you. I mean, you know, we got two, three kids that love you, but you know, we, we got to help you, you know, we got to get you out of this. And, uh, but unfortunately I was never able to do it. And, um, we lost him a little too early. So he was only uh, 64. So. Wow. Okay. I'm oh, sorry to hear that. Sorry to hear that. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess um, it is what it is. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you gotta, you know, you do the best you can, right? You do the try it. Best. Try it. So. It's hard to look back, but so one of the things, you know, in the Citadel, one of the things, our big mantra at the Citadel is carpe diem. It means it's Latin for seize the day. You know, yeah. so that's kind of my, I got it on all my things that, Hey, that's my, well, well, that's my on. MO is seize the day. Hold on a second. Were you a Marine? Uh, no, actually I did army RTC. So the, the Citadel oh. is basically, uh, you can do any, any branch. So Marine Corps is uh, Semper Fi. Semper Fi. Yeah. Always, yeah. That means always faithful. Um, but you know, it's all in our Citadel ring and it's, you know, it's all throughout the Citadel is carpe diem and seize the day, you know, I try to, try to make the most out of every day. And that's why I try to live my life is, you know, my, my personal life and my professional life is, you know, try to seize the day and do what I can and spend time with family and, you know, but also try to get deals done to, to make a living. You know? Yeah, no, I, I hear, I mean, I grew up, my father was a Marine. He was a Korean war veteran. He fought in the Korean war. So awesome. uh, it's uh, I know what that's like for sure. Growing up with a, uh, uh, it doesn't get any. I always say it doesn't get any tougher than a Sicilian, hard-headed, Korean <laughs> War veteran Marine. It's uh, oh yeah, I'm sure you had it rough. It's yeah. his way or the highway, man. It was. Uh, well, I know, but I attribute it to him. I mean, listen, I, I have two older brothers, and we all got into trouble here and there growing up. But we never, you know, we always knew we had to face him if we got into real trouble. And I, I attribute to his style of discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, we we all made it out good. I mean, we're, you know, we we're all, awesome. all doing, doing well. So, um, so now comes the time. Any questions that you want to ask myself? No questions uh, spared here. I mean, ask me anything. Well, yeah, let's let's turn it back on you. And I'll see. You know, you you founded three or four different companies. You're the CEO, and they're all finance. Like, what what would you want to do if you weren't doing finance? Like, what, what what's your kind of ultimate goal? I'd be a race car driver. NASCAR? Of course. Um, na either NASCAR, you know, a, a good friend of mine is Kurt Busch. Uh, okay. I, I know Kurt Busch really well, actually. But uh, I, I would either either that or, you know, more of like uh, F1 or you yeah. know, the, any of the GT3 circuits. I mean, I love cars. That's, that's yeah. one thing I do love. And I love working on them. So I always say, man, my, my job that – but, you see, in that, in that sport, you got to start out young. I mean, yeah. you got to be racing go-karts at, you know – Seven is seven, eight years old, yeah. which I'm trying to get my kids into now because I have a an eight, a, a eight year old son, ten year old daughter. But yeah, I'd be a, I think I'd be a race car driver. It's that adrenaline and yeah, uh, I just love it. I love it. Everything. Oh. About it. So, what kind of car you got in your garage right now? You got to have some kind of muscle car, don't you? Uh, you know, no, I'm more of a European guy. My okay. brother likes the muscle cars. He's got a he's got a. Uh, a uh, what is it a 69 chevelle ss with the stripes going up the middle um mm -hmm. i'm more of a i'm more of a european guy so i like you know i'm a big i mean my daily car is an amg i love uh you know i have a i have a mercedes amg car um you know and i i race uh you know porsches things like that so oh wow well, good i huh? yeah, did man. not know that that's uh you know i wasn't really into cars but i watched gone in 60 seconds when i was <laughs> probably in middle school and i I knew I wanted me a 67 Shelby GT500. I was like, that's the car I need. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to get it, you know? So yeah. it's, uh, it's a great movie. That's it. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so, you know, honestly, you know, as entrepreneur, entrepreneur, you know, one of the things I 100% believe in is having mentors, you know, to get to, 
you know, I wouldn't be running the day without several people that, you know, that weren't even in finance that just kind of helped shape who I am. And, you know, I want to be like you, what do I need to do to get there? And what are, do you, do you have two or three people in mind that uh, were kind of your mentors growing up that said, Hey, this is, you know, they got you to where you're at. You know, it's, it's going to sound cliche, but I didn't, I didn't really have any finance mentors. I, the, the one mentor I credit to, and I, we, talked, we just talked about this, is my father. Because he didn't really have a lot of money. He didn't make a lot of money. But he always made sense when I would come to him for advice, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the things, so little fact that a lot of people don't know is when I was about 14, 15 years old, um, I actually had a chance to go to a very prominent music school because I had a hidden talent. I actually played piano and I learned to play by, e- I learned to play by ear. There was no one had a musical talent and I actually got a scholarship to go to Juilliard and I went to, and, and here's the thing, like I, I liked music, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't love it. But I asked my father for advice at the time and he goes, look, son, I'll support you whatever way I can. But he goes, you know, you could be the best musician in the world, but it doesn't mean you're going to be able to raise a family. It doesn't mean you're going to be able to make any money on it. And I look at that today and it's true. I mean, I, there's guys that I used to hang with back in those days. Cause we, we'd go to these like music camps and such jazz mm-hmm. camps and they're, they're great. I mean, they're playing and, and they're some of the best musicians better than some of the people you may know, but they live a hard life. They're working 360 days a year, living gig to gig. And you know, I'm, yeah. It's, it's hard, you know, it's a lot of it's luck. So he always made a lot of sense um, to me, you know, just co- what I say, common sense. You know, one of the things he used to say is, you know, you, you hear all the time, Tony Robbins and all these motivational people, they used to say, follow your dreams, follow your dreams. Well, my father would always say, follow your dreams will get you killed. He goes, follow your actions, and it's your actions, which will get you towards your dreams. And he goes, you got to have an action plan with everything. And I still, I still carry that today with everything I do. And, you know, I think it's gotten me to places. So, um, yeah, I, if I had to pick one person, it'd be him. Man, that's great. Yeah. That's, having a, a good father figure as a mentor. That's, that's, that's great. I, I try to do the same for my son. Yeah. You know, my dad really wasn't that f- mentor father figure to me. You know, he had a lot of problems. So I, I always kind of, you know, like I said, he motivates you. I always use him as the opposite. Like, hey, I, I want to be kind of opposite of this guy. What do I need to do to be like your dad? That's, that's a, a mentor to my son and my daughter, to, you know, be all the things that my dad really wasn't. But, you know, he wanted to, but just couldn't with his disease, you know. So, I mean, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're good. You know, and, that's, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a positive way of looking at it. I mean, you're an optimist, right? I mean, it sounds like you're an optimist. I mean, to say, yeah. look, I can't what can I take away from what I didn't have to be a role model to my children? You know, that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, people always be negative and pessimistic. Oh, well, I didn't have this. I didn't have this. What was me, but blame. Was, Hey, what, what turn it into positive? What, what did I do and how can I make it better? You know, that's, that's just, I'm always trying to looking up and figuring out ways to try to be positive. And well, I think a lot of people have excuses and they, they bring that up as an excuse, Oh yeah. you know, and it's like, all right, we get it. It happened a long time ago, but like take that and fuel your energy to kind of do something positive. Don't use it as an excuse or a crutch where you say I can't. Yeah. yeah, I was, yeah they, they just hold on to it for you. Oh, I can't do this or I can't do that. You know, again, it's about starting your own company. Well, Hey, Oh, I got a wife and kids now. I, I just, I can't afford to do that. I'm, you know, I'm too comfortable. And it's all right. Well, good luck. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's kind of, you know, you know, it takes a certain personality to, to do, to be an entrepreneur and um, you got to be a risk taker. And so it's, but you know, and everyone's meant to be entrepreneurs and we need some people that kind of help us out. You know, sure. they want the, the second, you know, the right hand man that's behind the scenes and that's great. We need those guys too, you know, so uh, it all works out. Well, let's talk about uh, more real important things. College football, Chris, you're a football <laughs> guy. What's your thoughts about college football? You think they're going to play, and and should they play? What do you thought? What's your thoughts? You know, I don't think they're going to play, uh, but I don't agree with it. If that makes sense, I think they should play. Um, you know, I think I think people are nervous about you know coming out and and just trying to resume you know operating on different standards, but try to resume normal life, right? I mean, I, I don't. I think they should play. I think they should play. Do I think they're going to? 
you know, I like to be an optimist, but probably not being that there's kids involved and, you know, I mean, pro sports is different, right? You're getting paid millions of dollars, but being that it's college and I think it's a little different. I mean, what do you think? I don't know. I, I think the SEC is pretty big. So I think they're, I think, they're I think they probably will. And I, I think the big 10 is probably going to end up realizing when they, if they actually do move forward this thing that I think they may turn, turn their corner here and say, Hey, you know what? We want a part of this and we, we, we may play too. Cause you know, a lot of, and I think, you know, it goes kind of the coaches and the kids, you know, I think everyone should have the opportunity to opt out if they want to opt out. You know, I think there's some kids, some athletes that already opted out, you know, at LSU that, you know, they could play if they want to, but, but I think the good, the good majority of these kids want to play, you know, and I think they need to play if they want to play and the coaches want to, I mean, it's, you know, it's, again, this is just my personal opinion, but this COVID, you know, it's like with school, I'm on the school board down here and, you know, I got a lot of pushback from parents. Hey, we shouldn't go back to school. You know, the, the safety of these kids, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and so we gave them option. Hey, you got the virtual option or you got face to face. And sure. we had, you know, 90 some percent take the, the face to face option. And we've been in school two weeks now. And yeah, we've had a couple incidents of, of COVID pop up and we've quarantined, but the overwhelming majority of kids love it. And I mean, they want to be back in school. The teachers love it. I mean, obviously they're wearing the face mask and, you know, those type of things, but yeah. I just think it's just good for just their social well-being that, hey, we need to get back to some kind of normalcy. And I think the same thing with, with sports. You know, a lot of these kids, that's that's their, that's where they look forward to going with the school every day that, hey, one day, you know, I can, I can play football and I could play, you know, whatever sports on a co co collegiate level. Sure. And these guys are hoping that, hey, one day I'm trying to get the NFL here, right? right? And that's my dream. Right. Now I want, if I want to go out there and play and take that liability, let me go play, you know? And, um, and I think you see a lot of the statistics, you know, COVID cases are coming down. And, you know, again, the CDC came out with that thing where, hey, you know, really only 6% of those things were um, actually related to actual COVID. A lot of them had other symptoms. And, you know, right. look at the demographics of, you know, 18 to 24. I mean, it's, it's even lower, you know. And so there's, you know, I, I just, I don't know, I think it's been politicized a little bit. And, I, I mean, obviously, I'm not negating any deaths at all. I mean, they're, they're, they are what they are. But I mean, if you take it the big scheme of things. Yeah. You know, I was looking at this up with my, my brother-in-law. I mean, half a million kids go missing every year in the United States. But yet, that, that's not that big an issue that people haven't really, you know, kids, honestly, I'm on the school board, but that, it's a big thing to me, you know, sure. helping you keep the youth and the kids make sure they're successful. I mean, that's half a million kids go missing every year, and 180,000 people have died from COVID. Well, there's, 100, there's half a million kids that probably dead or you know, in trafficking or whatever. And yeah. no one's even talking about it right. yet. 180,000 and only 6% of them were actually really COVID and the rest of them were, you know, they had some other illness and also contributed, you know, sure. so I mean, when you put yeah. that in perspective for me, that's when I'm like, man, let's play football and let's, let's get on with the world and let's go back to school. Let's go back to, you know, and let's, you know, and, you know, the flu, there's more people dying from the flu every year than what's, what's passed. And so I, I think a lot of it's been politicized, but again, that's just my personal opinion and we'll see what happens here. But I do know that we'll news, I do know that news sells. News is a yeah. big yeah. business. <laughs> so, so we'll see. Yeah. It's, you know, the, the doom and gloom sells and, you know, so it, it, that's kind of the, it just feels like that's the narrative of everybody right now is, Hey, it's just bad, bad. Well, right? well and, and you know what? Like, listen, if, if, People are telling us to take precautions. All right, let's take precautions, but open up. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Open up. Open up, you know, businesses and, you know, let's. Okay. Yeah, you know, I was, you know, I don't want to get too into politics, but, like, you know, the mayor of Philly, I was, I just did a deal up there a couple of months ago, right before COVID, and, you know, he shut down restaurants. And then he, there's a picture of him basically eating in Maryland, <laughs> just dining in in a Maryland restaurant, but yet he's shutting these businesses down and hey, you can't open for, for business inside your establishment. These, I mean, you got businesses that are going out, of, they're going out of business and we've got a lot of their loans and yeah, you know, I mean, all these lenders across the country. Hey, they're about to have a huge wave of, of lenders or of borrowers that are about to start defaulting on their loans because yeah. they can't open up, you know? So right. anyway, well, yeah. I'm all for opening up safely. So we'll yeah, see. me too. Me too, man. I, I hope we can get, you know, get past this and I hope, uh, you know, 20, we all look back on this and talk about to our grandchildren how, you know, screwed up 2020. Yeah, yeah, it's a crazy world, man. So everything. Now we got an election coming up, so. Yeah, yeah. It's been crazy. Ready, ready for it to be, be done. We <laughs> got to get back to it. So. <laughs> sure, for sure. Um, well, listen, man, I, um, I really appreciate you taking your time. I know you're a busy guy and uh, Absolutely. You know, to come and, and just chat with us for a little bit. 
I think it's great. I think uh, a lot of, a lot of, you know, a lot of brokers that look into us say, gee, I wonder what your lenders are like. And this is great just to get a little personality behind yeah, it. Absolutely. Man. I want to appreciate the opportunity to, to come on your show. So, I mean, it's, I think this is great. This is again, being innovative. Like, hey, let's start doing these podcasts to just people at home at their office. Like, what can we do to just kind of driving in the car? They could be listening. So this is, this is yeah. very innovative. Great, great idea. Yeah. Um, and we're going to, you know, we're going to be on all the streaming services in terms of audio and, we're really looking to promote this, you know, and it's, it's one of those things where you can't, I mean, could we have sent cameras out to your place and say, do like a corporate, you know, testimonial of who North Avenue is and how you work with CCTG, but this is real. I mean, it's, 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 it's a lot, I think it's a lot better. I mean, it's just, yeah, I think it's more authentic and genuine yeah. people, you know, they can tell when it's, Hey, it's a corporate, it's made up and that was all for show, you know? So I'm hoping people will say, Hey, look, we're, I'm just a down to earth guy. And so is the guys on girls on my team. And look, we're, we're just like you and we're trying to make a living and help people and try to get deals done. So, all right. And you know, before I let you go, is there one thing that I could force you to say? Um, no, I don't really, uh, is, I don't know. I mean, is there one thing I could ask you and force you to say? No, I don't think so. What you got? All right. Can you say that? Um, the, the experience with working with CCTG brokers are a lot better than working with non-CCTG brokers? <laughs> Absolutely, Chris. Absolutely. CCTG is one of the best brokers I've ever worked with. And, um, and, that's, and that, that is the truth. We've worked with a bunch. And like I said, Jason and Ben and Tyler, I mean, we, we, we look at a lot. And, you know, as, as a deal guy, and, you know, we look at a lot of deals. And if you get a broker that sends you, well, guess where that goes? It's the bottom of my stack. Dude, I've, I've got 15 deals I'm looking at right now and if somebody calls me and doesn't know their deal and just trying to send me oh hey let me send you the Dropbox link and <laughs> okay well there's 105 items in there well what's what, what's the need what do you how much in, well it's in the Dropbox man I ain't got time for that well you tell me what you want so I can start figuring out I'm not gonna sit here and waste time well you just, what do you think you can do I'm like, man there there's a lot of different things I can do you can yeah, tell me what they yeah. want and we can kind of start there so yeah Having a knowledge of kind of what they're doing and knowing the borrower and knowing kind of what the ask is, I mean, that, that's what we want as lenders. Like, don't waste my time, man. I, I've got a lot of deals. You yeah. know, and I, again, I want to be cognizant of your time and I want to get back to you within 24, 40 hours. And if you send me a Dropbox link with a hundred items in the data room, well, man, I'm not going to get to you. It's going to be three, four days and, or I'm not just, Hey, I got time for that. I'm, I'm going to go to help these brokers that, you know, Hey Eric, here's what I need. Here's what I think we can do. You know, come with, you know, just like, you know, anything in leadership, right? It's like, hey, come with me with a solution. Right. Hey, Eric, here's, you know, Chris, hey, here's what I want to do. Here's what I think we can do. Do you think this will work? Then I can try to work from there versus just, hey, here's what I got. Let me know. <laughs> you know, not the well, I'll let you know in a week or so. I ain't got time for that. I'll, I'll get back to you. So, yeah, having, having that knowledge and skill set. So, I think having that training is instrumental in helping brokers get more deals done because there's a ton of lenders out there and I know there's a ton of brokers. And well, I appreciate you saying that I was joking, sure. but I was kind of not joking. So. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. No, thank you so much. You. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, that's all the time we have for today. Eric, I'm going to thank you once more. Uh, you and North Avenue Capital are doing great things and I wish you guys continued success. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Have a good all, right. Day. all right. So that's all we have for this episode in entrepreneurs in finance. Um, where we explore the daily lives of lenders and brokers. We'll catch you on the next one. Thank you. There are just too many commercial loan brokers that don't have a damn clue of what they're doing. All we're trying to do here is better the industry for everybody. At the end of the day, you can make great money in this industry, but in the end, it's all about helping people. You know, people always say, Chris, how can I be a successful broker? It's two words, hard work and dedication. If you don't like talking to people, you probably shouldn't be in this business.